All right. Of our time? Uh, I'll leave you to the Go ahead. Uh, so All right. We're going to right. We're gonna go ahead and okay. get started here. Uh, my name is Brian, Brian Lance. I'll be leading our discussion and making a presentation here this morning, so, or this afternoon, so glad to have you here on Saturday, December 7th. Um, this day, December 7th, as many of you know, this is the anniversary of the uh, bombing of Pearl Harbor, uh, which brought the U.S. dramatically uh, into World War II. Um, and. Uh, had a, a shock effect um, across the nation, a wake-up call, if you will, um, which Mr. LaRouche, Lyndon LaRouche, identified at the time. I believe it was New York City where he was. Um, uh, and uh, he walked into a hotel and he could just feel it in the room. Something had happened and, uh, um, and it was the news that was just then breaking about what had happened in at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Uh, now, you, citizens began lining up, young men started lining up at, at uh, the draft offices uh, to join uh, the Army. Uh, there was a tremendous outpouring across the nation. And uh, I mention this not to try to uh, provide a lot of details here, but Today, um, we're aiming for the same kind of shock effect um, uh, to the developments going on, uh, dramatic developments going on in the world uh, over the coming days and weeks. And so let me just uh, start. Um, um, first, though, I want to, uh, I want to uh, uh, present our, our pamphlet this has been published by Executive Intelligence Review, our sister organization, sister organization to the Schiller Institute. Um, Executive Intelligence Review, which has been being published since 1974, uh, has just published in the McCarthyite witch hunt against China and President Trump. Uh, and this is now available across the United States. It's available online at uh, www.larouchepack.com. Um, uh, available free for download and I urge people to read this. This is a, a short 20 some page pamphlet uh, which takes you through the, uh, uh, the uh, witch hunt against China uh, by uh, refuting it uh, and showing uh, the basis, scientific basis, uh, the reasoned basis for US-China collaboration. And of course, pointing out, as the title does, that the witch hunt against China is uh, directed by the same uh, British Empire, Anglo-American uh, interests uh, that are uh, attempting to topple the presidency of Donald Trump. Uh, so uh, I recommend this to everybody. And we'll try to have a link of this uh, uh, on the uh, website. Um, secondly, I want to mention, I don't have a lot of details yet, but. Uh, we've just learned that this past Wednesday, uh, so that would have been the 4th, I believe, December 4th, uh, Helga Zeppelarouche was in Beijing uh, for the founding of a, uh, the think tank by CGTN, uh, the, the international uh, media broadcasting um, uh, network of China. Uh, there was uh, 27 uh, experts from think tanks and other organizations uh, who were represented on stage, Helga Zeppelin LaRouche, the president of the Scheller Institute, being one of those individuals, uh, all told some 300 guests. And we'll be uh, learning more about this and what this think tank will be doing. Uh, but uh, uh, Helga did report, uh, you know, the, the, the need the need for an understanding of what is occurring uh, around the coup in the United States. Uh, it, the questions about who and what and where and why uh, this coup is occurring now, this attempt to, to remove uh, President Trump by impeachment. Uh, so, um, so those are uh, introductory just uh, kind of announcements. And now we'll go to the, the, to, to the core of the presentation. I, I want to start by just again bringing forward 
the, 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 the role of space and cooperation in space, space exploration, space science, is being uh, an area both of past uh, uh, progress for mankind, uh, but also uh, critical to the future. And so if we can go to the uh, first uh, slide uh, we have up there, um, and many of you know this gentleman, I'm going to turn off the light here uh, for people here in the room. Uh, this is Kraft Erica. Uh, if God wanted men, man to become a spacefaring species, Kraft Erica said, he would have given man a moon, which of course is exactly what uh, God gave man. He gave man a moon. Uh, and uh, at this very moment, uh, the uh, Chang'e 4 uh, uh, is a uh, mission of China, is represented on the far side of the moon by their rover, um, uh, which is carrying out exploration. And now we know, just uh, as of this week, that the, uh, uh, that the uh, uh, radio uh, spectrum uh, telescope uh, on board the Chang'e 4 uh, orbiter, um, a, a project, the, a joint project between the Netherlands and China, has begun operation. Uh, so for the first time, man has a, uh, uh, a, uh, a telescope operating in the radio wave range, operating from uh, the moon, uh, and this is going to be extremely important for future science. We've not been able to see out into space in that portion of the spectrum from Earth because of our, our own radio waves generated here on Earth, um, as well as other interference, man-made and otherwise. Uh, from the far side of the moon, um, there's an entirely different perspective. And so we're going to see processes at work that we haven't seen before. Uh, Kraft Erika spelled out, uh, this was some five decades ago, spelled out the three fundamental laws of astronautics. Uh, Kraft Erika being a leading German-American space scientist, uh, the developer of, of the uh, uh, one of the most, well, the first oxygen-hydrogen rocket engine, which is still being used today uh, in U.S. spacecraft, uh, and uh, wrote ex uh, extensively, just to, to say who he was. He was one of the German scientists who came over to the United States after the end of World War II. And he spelled out the three fundamental laws of astronautics. The first law, and I'm, that's what I'm just going to mention here and, and quote out loud, nobody and nothing under the natural laws of this universe imposes any limitation on man except for man himself. Nobody and nothing under the natural laws of the universe imposes any limitations on man except for man himself. Um, go on to the next slide, if you will. Thanks, Mike. Now, we're, we're at a stage here where the future progress of mankind in space is, has been emphasized uh, by uh, China's scientists uh, working on the space program, uh, but also uh, exemplified by the U.S. cooperation with Russia. I mean, after all, as, as you should know, we can't even get to the International Space Station without uh, Russian rockets uh, and Russian rocket engines, and uh, and that's uh, and that uh, cooperation goes back uh, decades again, back to the very creation of the International Space Station, which was a joint initially a joint U.S.-Russian project. That was a carrying forward of what President John F. Kennedy posed in 1963 uh, to the United Nations. This was just one after one year after the Cuban Missile Crisis. He proposed in his final speech before the uh, United Nations, uh, and I have up just a short quote from that speech, which, which, which is more extensive, but he states that the United States and Soviet Union have a special capacity, uh, that there is room for new cooperation, for further joint efforts, including among, he says, a, a, the possibilities of a joint expedition to the moon. Uh, so this is 1963, a year, just one year after the Cuban Missile Crisis, one year after we almost came to blows um, 
and, and, and the fate of the human race was, was uh, on the line. Yet one year later, this could already be, be proposed by President John F. Kennedy. And, and, and it's certainly, uh, certainly the evidence exists that if John F. Kennedy had lived, uh, uh, that proposal uh, would have been taken up, as we know from uh, uh, Khrushchev's son, among others. So, uh, so moving on to the next slide. Now, counterposed to that, uh, uh, counterposed in terms to, to that optimism, uh, uh, the uh, statement of the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Gutierrez, this is at the COP25 conference that just wrapped up in Madrid uh, in Spain. He says, I'm convinced that Europe will be in a position to negotiate with China, with India, with the United States, and with Russia in a way that will allow all to understand that this must be a collective effort. A collective effort, is he talking about for space? Is he talking about for scientific collaboration in, in uh, ending poverty globally? Uh, no. Uh, we will correct their policies, he says. Europe will, will uh, be able to convince China, India, the United States, and Russia to co collectively uh, correct their policies in order to be able to drastically reduce emissions, CO2 emissions. Now, CO2 is not, you know, CO2 is not carbon monoxide, it's carbon dioxide. You know, it, it is only 0.04% of the atmosphere. Uh, increases, decreases in CO2, decreases might be a problem for, for plant life, mm -hmm. but CO2 uh, is, is such a, a minor fraction of the atmosphere um, that for us to be whipped up uh, by the media, for not uh, much less Antonio Gutierrez um, here attempting to uh, uh, not just propose, but he's expressing an outlook which is being promoted uh, by the oligarchy in uh, Europe and, and their similar elk in the United States like Michael Bloomberg, uh, that everything has to be done to reduce these emissions, including ending all coal and natural ga gas uh, production and utilization uh, in, uh, in uh, certainly Europe and the United States by 2030 um, and so on, uh, which would ha have devastating effects uh, so I counterposing this pessimism, move on to the next, and we have here Dr. Happer, uh, who was also in Madrid, but for another purpose, speaking, uh, this is for the uh, uh, conference uh, that was organized there by the Heartland Institute, rebutting the UN climate delusion. And Dr. Happer, who is the former deputy assistant to the President of the United States on uh, on emerging technologies to the National Security Council, former head of the physics department of Princeton, he states the following, it's hard to understand how much further this shrillness can go. And he goes on to say, but stick around, it will happen. I hope sooner or later enough people recognize the holiness of this bizarre environmental cult and bring it to an end. We have a climate crusade this is not science, it is a religion. Crusades have a bad way of ending. Typically, many, many people are hurt. No good is done. But a few cynical opportunists profit, and most people pay the price. The same will happen with the climate crusade if we permit it to go forward. And I pray that we can stop it before it does too much damage. And uh, so we... We really have here counterpose uh, a, 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 a distinction and outlook from the outlook of Kraft, Erica, and Kennedy uh, in this case, uh, and uh, to uh, the outlook expressed by Gutierrez and Michael Bloomberg and uh, uh, Carney, the head of the Bank of England, uh, and others who are intent on imposing a uh, a short circuit of the economy through the shutdown of energy production, um, and particularly uh, uh, capital intensive uh, and energy dense production. Go on to the next slide. 
Now, it's not accidental that he's proposing that Europe has to convince the United States, India, China, and Russia, because these are the four key world-leading nations, which are the basis today of bringing about a new Bretton Woods, of addressing what is a growing global financial crisis. And this is the context in which to understand the coup attempt against President Trump, Donald Trump. Nothing short of this. We ha we're at a, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, we're at a, uh, a point of inflection, a point of sea change one way or the other. We're either going to go forward on the basis of new reorganization based on the future of mankind in space, or to try to save what is already a collapsing, uh, uh, dysfunctional uh, system in the West. Uh, a friend of mine called it uh, a system run by high-dollar white trash, uh, <laughs> to quote uh, Dennis Speed uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from New York, uh, LaRouche Pack, um, uh, who are intent upon imposing uh, the impoverishment which much of the world, the so-called third world, still suffers from upon all of us. Um, so a very stark uh, choice is being made. Now let me, re let me, uh, uh, you can just stop, we can just leave that slide up or you can uh, take it down at, re regardless. But just turning briefly to the coup attempt, um, there is, uh, and I really urge people to, to take the time if they, uh, if they have not already to listen to to the, uh, to the fireside chat uh, broadcast last Thursday uh, with Barbara Boyd from the Executive Intelligence Review and the Lush Pack uh, and uh, Larry Johnson, former CIA analyst. Um, but let me just summarize, there is now a race on. This is a race ahead of what? It's a race ahead of the Horowitz Report, which comes out this coming week, uh, ahead of the uh, outcome of the Michael Flynn case, former National Security Council director appointed by President Trump, who was removed um, uh, uh, under uh, 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 nefarious circumstances, which are now is now the matter of court proceedings in Washington, and a decision on that is expected soon, and the upcoming findings. Uh, of the grand jury that's been convened in Washington, D.C., at the urging of John Durham, the appointed prosecutor, uh, investigator and prosecutor, appointed by William Barr, the Attorney General of the United States, to investigate the origins of the spying and other attempts to manipulate and undermine the Trump presidential campaign and to undermine the Trump presidency itself. Um, um, and this includes the Steele dossier uh, and uh, other, uh, other elements, the role of Comey, the former director of the CIA, uh, and other figures, um, uh, including figures that are still currently in the Trump administration, uh, as far as we understand. So these investigations are going to be coming forward, and they're going to make very clear uh, to the American people that what the American people have been put through over the last two plus years, three years, in terms of Russia Gate, Mueller Gate, and now Ukraine Gate, that all of this has been a orchestrated coup centered from London, orchestrated on defending the special relationship of Britain and the United States, the United States being the dumb giant on the British leash. Uh, as the traditional uh, saying goes. Um, and, uh, and very important to all of this, the elephant in the bedroom uh, is Ukraine. The, uh, what actually is going on in Ukraine? You may know that right now uh, uh, Rudolf Giuliani is in the Ukraine again, uh, meeting with uh, former prosecutors uh, uh, attorneys general and so forth of Ukraine. Um, uh, so the, the, uh, uh, the Trump, Trump himself through his own attorney uh, is aggressively pursuing 
the role that Ukraine played or figures in Ukraine played in uh, the period before the elections, 2.15 and into the early part of 2016. In terms of, and what does Ukraine involve? It involves the coup that was carried out in 2014 against Ukraine. This is, this is what's not being talked about, and we've been emphasizing this point. What's not being talked about in the hearings up on Capitol Hill, the House uh, intelligence hearings that have occurred, and now, of course, things are going to be shifting to the uh, House uh, Judiciary Committee next week. Uh, what has not been discussed is the fact that the Obama administration, together with the British uh, regime, government, um, uh, and, and uh, Queen uh, carried out a coup against the democratically elected government of Ukraine in 2014, the so-called Maidan coup. Um, and the figures involved in that uh, coup, including Victoria Nuland, including uh, Christopher Steele, uh, who is the uh, officially the former uh, head of the Russia desk for MI6, that's the British equivalent of the CIA. Um, these figures and the figures that testified were testifying uh, in the course of the last two weeks up on Capitol Hill, including Fiona Hill. These people were all deeply engaged in carrying out that coup and orchestrating that coup as a full spectrum warfare operation against Ukraine. And those figures, in fact, then turned and were utilized to launch a full spectrum, that, in, that means media, uh, mass media, saturation, utilization of the media, as well as every political, uh, um, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, dirty trick. Dirty trick, there you go. Uh, in the book, uh, to uh, uh, bring down the Trump uh, administration. And so what's being, un what's being investigated and Joe Biden, of course, played a role in this. This is what the investigation of Ukraine is that Trump, President Trump, uh, has been attempting to carry out. is an investigation of 2014, 2015, into early 2016. He's not concerned about Joe Biden in the 2020 election. I mean, as you can, if, if people have watched him at all, Joe Biden can <laughs> hardly carry an idea from one, one side of the room to the other. So, you know, this is not about Joe Biden or his son. Um, that's the smoke and mirrors. But I, I, I want to make another point very briefly that Barbara made. What is it that it, you, you may know, there's now a new president in, in Ukraine, Zelensky. What is it that prevents President Trump from simply saying to President Zelensky, who said that there was no quid pro quo and, that, and, and has stood beside Trump. What is preventing Trump from saying to Zelensky, we have your back, go and make peace with President Putin of Russia? What is stopping President Trump from making that important step to creating the Four Powers Alliance that's so critical right now to solving the, the, uh, the financial crisis, which I'll come back to in a minute, uh, solving uh, the uh, ongoing crisis in West Asia, in the so-called Middle East, uh, uh, resolving the arms crisis that's building up uh, now around the New START <coughs> Treaty. What is preventing from Trump from saying to President Zelensky, we have your back, go make an agreement with President Putin? Um, and the answer to that question is that President Trump is right now in a, a still in a box. He's under attack. He's limited in terms of his constraints. Just yesterday, uh, the foreign minister, even off of Russia, made this point. We understand the complicated situation that exists in the United States, pointing out that this limits the freedom of the president of the United States to respond to Russian offers uh, of, uh, for further negotiation, for example, on extending the New Star Treaty. Um, uh, this is known to the world, um, uh, and it's up to the American people, it's up to us 
to free President Trump to do what he himself has stated as, in, as his intention. The intention, as he said, he said it's a good thing to get along with China. It's a good thing to get along with Russia. That's a good thing. And that's what he's attempting to do. The trade negotiations continue with China, and hopefully that'll have a positive end. But the, the relations between China and Russia are much broader than that, much more important than simply a trade deal. Likewise with Russia. And then there's India as well. So uh, the question of, well, let me phrase it this way. This coming week, uh, assuming the vote goes as... as uh, as expected, at least expected by Nancy Pelosi. She may be in for a surprise, but assuming the vote goes the way Nancy Pelosi, uh, the Speaker of the House expects, the, the, uh, there will be a, uh, articles of impeachment drawn up uh, and there will be an impeachment process that will then be launched in the U.S. Senate. Now, our point on this, a very important point is, this is a excellent opportunity, perhaps the, the best kind of possibility, a perfect opportunity to educate the American people on the role of the presidency and on the U.S. Constitution. This could be the Pearl Harbor that sets the United States back on track. And I think that's uh, important for us to think about uh, but also think of it in terms of our own actions and our own activity, what, what we're doing and what we're setting in motion. The, 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 these hearings go to the very issue of what a federal presidency is about, what its role and importance is. Um, President Washington, with Alexander Hamilton, launched the United States as a federal republic and built the U.S. manufacturing, industrial, and scientific capacities of the United States from scratch. He did it one way. Lincoln, with the greenback policies, with the mobilization to save the Union, did it another way. Uh, President Roosevelt uh, used other means, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the Works Progress Administration, uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps to rebuild, pull the nation together and rebuild out of the Great Depression and uh, ultimately to defeat fascism in, in, uh, uh, in the world. Uh, they chose different means. What did they utilize in common was the power of the U.S. presidency. It's been pointed out, Dennis actually, Dennis <laughs> Speed uh, pointed this out the other day. The, the, you know, and he was quoting one of the founding fathers. Um, the, the, pre, the Constitution, in, 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 in many respects, fundamental respects, gives the President of the United States more power than a king has. Um, the, the President can wield that power. He can mobilize the American people. He can deploy resources, not merely uh, direct foreign affairs, <clears throat> which, of course, Nancy Pelosi is very much trying to uh, prevent, uh, among other figures. But... Uh, but uh, can mobilize the resources, the institutions of the United States, utilizing his power as President of the United States and as Commander-in-Chief. Uh, and that is what is required now in terms of a presidency to, to meet, with, meet the crisis that we have now. So let's just return, having said that, let's return to the next set of slides. The space effort is an example of this, of what President Trump is attempting to unleash. Project Artemis to put man, put a man and a woman back on the moon by 2024, within five years. Uh, Artemis 1 will launch this coming year. Knock on wood. It will launch this coming year. Uh, it'll be a trip around the moon to test the SLS special launch system um, uh, and, and, uh, and the... Uh, uh, and its uh, uh, orbiter and uh, what will eventually include the lander uh, for actually the moon uh, landing itself within, again, within five years. This is a very aggressive program. This is just a schematic of the steps uh, of the Artemis projects, one through three. Uh, to the next slide. <clears throat> this is uh, from the European Space Agency. This is a 
a, a schematic of, of a different sort. Uh, this is a, ex, their ExoMars mission. They're also going um, uh, 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 to the frontiers of science. This coming year, there are three, actually four, missions to Mars. The United Arab Emirates has a project going to, uh, to Mars this coming year uh, in conjunction, I believe, with SpaceX uh, uh, providing the launch vehicle. Uh, but in addition, uh, the United States is sending up Mars 2020. Um, and then you have the ExoMars project, which is a project between Russia and the, and, uh, and the European Space Agency. Uh, the uh, uh, ExoMars is intended to, ga uh, to gather samples and then in a, actually a complex kind of ballet that will occur over a number of years, those samples will be collected by another lander. Uh, uh, another rocket will launch those um, uh, samples uh, to the orbiter. Uh, and then another rocket will take uh, those samples back to Earth. Um, this, as I said, this will occur over a number of years. But this is the project that is now underway um, from Europe in conjunction with Russia. I mentioned earlier the collaboration of the Netherlands with China on Chang'e 4 and the radio telescope that's now in operation on the orbiter. Um, the China Space Agency is uh, seeking collaboration on Chang'e 5, Chang'e 6, the upcoming missions to the moon and, and to Mars. And that brings me to, the, uh, to China's mission to Mars. Uh, this month, uh, the Long March 5 missile uh, rocket will again be tested. Assume, assuming that goes well, then next year China will launch also its mission to Mars in that July-August window. Uh, so, uh, so four missions in total are going to Mars this coming year. So uh, on to the next slide. I just, uh, this, is a, this is a photograph uh, of, uh, from China uh, testing their lander uh, with its uh, attached rover um, system. Um, uh, Anyway, the, the lowering of the of the uh, of the uh, lander. Uh, UFO. Yeah, yeah, it looks like a UFO. Yes. Uh, uh, this this was this was uh, this is rigged so as to uh, imitate uh, the gravitational pull of the moon about of, of Mars, which is about thirty eight percent of that of the United, uh, of the world, U.S. of the Earth. Um, wow. So uh, uh, so it's a very complicated process, but uh, they they did this in public. There was. Uh, 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 news, newsmen from around the world, space uh, magazines and so on and so forth there for, uh, for this successful test. Uh, on to the next slide. Um, and all of this then, as many of you know, um, all of these projects, all of these projects beg uh, and otherwise will help develop uh, the use of helium-3 uh, in the development of fusion energy, including for the development of fusion rockets fusion-powered, uh, fusion-propulsion rocket engines. Deuterium-3 is, is a, a, an element found in relative abundance on the moon. Uh, and uh, extensive work is going on. Uh, uh, this is part of the Chang'e uh, 6 and 7 missions, uh, Chang'e 5 and 6 missions and so forth uh, to the to moon, and upcoming missions by Russia and the United States to the moon. Is, is to determine more specifically uh, what kind of mining technologies and so forth can be utilized uh, to gather helium-3 from the moon, something that's uh, virtually non-existent on, on, uh, on Earth, but av available there thanks to the sun uh, on the moon. Um, uh, helium-3 uh, is the, the most effective, along with deuterium, uh, fuel for fusion will allow us to get to the to Mars within days as opposed to months uh, in terms of uh, 1G gravitational propulsion. Uh, again, I'm not trying to spend a lot of time on this, but I'm trying to bring just back into all of our minds again in a fresh way, you know, the, the frontiers of discovery that are right now, right now happening around us. These missions to Mars that I'm talking about, this is 
We're in December. I'm talking about next year. I'm talking about July and August, seven months, eight months from now. These projects, these Mars, these Mars missions are being launched. Artemis One begins the process of the Artemis mission uh, to put man back on the moon, onto the next. So this is the context in which I think, uh, uh, as well as addressing the witch hunt directed at uh, China's scholars and students uh, in particular, and the entire uh, anti-China uh, environment that's been uh, 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 promulgated in the US fake news media, uh, this is another reason why uh, this absolutely has to be uh, addressed. In this pamphlet that you see up there on the screen, um, the first introduction to that pamphlet is uh, by uh, Helga Zeppelarouche titled Looking at China, the Secret of China's Success Model. Um, uh, if you go on, uh, then there's a, a, a speech from 1997 by Lyndon LaRouche, economist, statesman. Um, China and the United States, um, from 1997, identifying China and the United States as the two critical nations at that time that could change the course of mankind for the better if they took up collaboration on what, quote, sometimes is called the Silk Road Project sometimes the land bridge project and so forth. This is 1997 with a map then on page 9 of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, the world land bridge that could grow out of that kind of cooperation. And then there's a, a, a short but very specific report on the McCarthyite assault on China that must be stopped, uh, including the role of the, uh, Fu and Gong, which uh, follows. There's a separate chapter on Fulan Gong as a cult funded from the West, specifically from Britain. Uh, and, um, uh, and of course, we're covering the role of Ted Cruz and the National Endowment for Democracy and so forth as other features of that operation. Um, but uh, if I can find it very quickly here, uh, Stan Ezrell, in covering the Fulan Gong cult, uh, identifies the role of, of Bannon. Um, uh, the gentleman kicked out of the Trump administration. Uh, his role in uh, promoting the Fulan Gong, um, and specifically the center of uh, the institute, <coughs> uh, Steve Bannon uh, <coughs> uh, serves. Um, <coughs> Um, at a higher level than most people uh, think. Um, he is one of five sponsors of the DHI, Dignitas Humani Institute, the Institute of Human Dignity in the City of London. He is one, the four co-sponsors are Archduke Otto von Habsburg, the successor to the throne of the Holy Roman Emperor, which of course was dissolved, uh, His High Royal Highness Charles of Bourbon, two Sicilies, and Duke of Castro, um, uh, another right wing of the European nobility, Field Marshal Lord Guthrie, Knight of the Gro Gro Grand Cross, Lieutenant of the Victorian Order, uh, Order of the British Empire, and Father Matthew Festing. Um, uh, this is a, a cornerstone grouping behind Fulan Gong and behind Steve Bannon and the entire uh, witch hunt against China. And so that's uh, presented uh, uh, to researchers and the general public for further work. And the pamphlet ends with the collaboration that can be developed now between the United States and China and India and Russia. And what would the world look like um, um, if and when that occurs. Uh, so moving on to the next slide. <clears throat> uh, this is just uh, from my, uh, our recent trip. Evelyn and I, my wife and I, were recently in China. This is from May of this year. Uh, this is in uh, Beijing uh, at uh, Xinhua, the, the think tank the, the, uh, of theirs in, China, in Beijing. Um, and we're holding a discussion there uh, on 
uh, covering, among other things, the coup going on in the United States. Tremendous numbers of questions and so forth uh, in that regard. Uh, but just to, say, just to indicate uh, our ongoing collaboration, and I, and I mentioned more importantly at the beginning, uh, uh, this last Wednesday, Helga Zeppel-Rouche, uh, the president of the Schiller Institute, was in Beijing for the founding of the CGTN think tank. Um, so uh, there will be more on that. Is this uh, Renmin Dashway? This, this is the uh, Shenhua Shen News Service Global Affairs Think Tank. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. Mm -hmm. uh, on to the next. Now, China, I mean, I, I want to, depending on the audience, of course, this varies, and, and, and uh, uh, I'll try to keep this brief, but this is, this is China's uh, largest fusion uh, project to develop fusion energy, their fusion research uh, project. Um, and uh, uh, again, just to indicate, uh, this question of a crash program for fusion energy development. This is in the other direction. I, I referenced Antonio Gutierrez at the Mad Madrid COP25 environmental uh, genocide conference, I'll call it, uh, proposing a massive uh, downgrading of, of, of human production and uh, energy utilization and so forth. The other direction is nuclear energy and beyond that fusion. And a crash program for fusion energy is again like the space program, another area in which US, China, Russia, Russia has an enormous fusion program going back uh, 40 plus years. Um, uh, this is critical to the future of, of mankind with fusion energy um, utilizing deuterium from, from salt water um, and, uh, he and helium-3, or hydrogen-3, helium-3. Um, uh, we have the access to, to virtually unlimited energy for mankind. And utilizing the fusion torch, plasma condition created by uh, the fusion process, we can recycle all waste. We can reutilize all waste, Matt, you know, uh, 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 metals, plastics, um, living matter and so on and so forth can be recycled uh, to, uh, to, uh, to be used uh, indefinitely. So, uh, so this really ends once and for all uh, the, the idea of limits to growth. On to the next. And again, here's a picture of, of China's high-speed rail system. Uh, I chose this photograph just to give you a sense. Some people think of there being a single train somewhere running around, you know, that's, uh, th but this is a typical uh, rail station in a major city in China. This is just a portion. Uh, some of the pictures of Shanghai I've seen, you, you can see 30, roughly, mm -hmm. 25, 30 of these things across different lanes coming in and out of, of Shanghai. Mm -hmm. This is an enormous system of high-speed rail, efficient high-speed rail, passenger rail, uh, alongside of what they have in terms of freight and, uh, and, and normal rail. So, uh, again, this is just to indicate the transformation that's been occurring in China. 800 million people have been lifted out of extreme poverty uh, in a generation. 800 million. Um, there is no such poverty alleviation program in the United States and Europe. Uh, and, indeed, this is what we, again, could cooperate on. We could learn a lot from working with uh, China and China's scientists, researchers, uh, and planners, and economists. On to the next. Is, is this, does, this, does that train go all over the whole landmass of China, or just in the city? China uh, is such a big country. Does that yeah, speed well, go all over? Or well, this is the, this next slide here. I'll answer your question. I'll come. This is the, the Eurasian, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative launched by China in 2013. This is just a kind of colorful map that just gives you a sense of the breadth and depth of this system, which involves rail links all the way through Europe. Oh, okay. I mean, there's now thousands of trains back and forth from Europe to China and so forth. These are not, in general, high-speed rail trains, but they're very modern uh -huh. unit uh, uh, rail system trains, rail tr uh, trains. Um, 
And uh, as you see, the, the blue there, it's a little light, but the blue uh, across the Indian Ocean and so forth to Africa, um, this is the Maritime Silk Road. Uh, and uh, projects, of course, on both sides of the coast of, of Africa uh, are, are, are not just occurring on the coast, but uh, together the African Union, together with uh, China, have agreed on uh, the collaboration in building out a high-speed rail system linking all the capitals in Africa. Um, so this is just, again, a, a feature of it. But I wanted to get on, I think it's the next slide, or uh, well, go on the next. We can come back to uh, one more. One more. Oh, <laughs> where, there it is. Thank you. I have too many slides, uh, as usual. Uh, <laughs> This is, uh, this is from, this was published in 1920. This is um, on the international development of China, uh, written by Sun Yat-sen, um, the founder of modern China, uh, the Republic of China. Uh, and what you see there in terms of a rail system, I put that up to just give you a sense that um, if you, if in broad breast strokes, the high-speed rail ch uh, system of China takes in all of the major uh, cities in China oh, today. Yeah. And of course, other rail uh, fills in the rest. Uh, but there's now over, um, I, if I, I remember the figure right, it's close to 40,000 kilometers of high-speed rail in, in China now, or soon will be. Maybe the figure is by 2030. But uh, uh, it, you, it's an enormous system. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but the, the trains, the trains in, in China go are, are, go on route. So you have from Beijing to Shanghai, you have from Beijing to Xi'an, you have, you know, you have different routes, and they're going back and forth on those routes. And uh, just, just, it's just useful to realize when they talk about high speed, they're not talking about 65, 70 miles an hour. Uh, mm -hmm. They're talking about 160 to 240 miles an hour. Yeah. No way. Yeah, these go 300, 350 kilometers an hour, average no, speed. No, no, that was miles an hour, I said. I know. I, I said 300, 350 oh, oh, kilometers yeah. an hour. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, two, you know, 160, 100, 200 miles an hour. Yes, right. Yeah. If I Real high speed. Correctly, uh, uh, that that uh, the same people who are pushing the CO2 urgency today were saying a couple of decades back that uh, Chinese would be uh, enjoying mass starvation instead yes. of high speed rail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, today, so there might be something wrong with their thinking. That's a good <laughs> point. That's a good point, Mark. Yeah. Paul Ehrlich was among the, the, uh, was among those that promoted uh, promoted that view. That is wrong with your thinking. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, well, let, let's just move move on from from maybe from here. Backwards and forwards. Well, forwards. What do we got moving forwards here? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, the financial crisis. Uh, I, I, I indicated it earlier. Now, this is, you know, this is where we've got a, a, a job in educating the American people, but also educating President Trump. Um, you know, warnings have been made for, for, for the past decade or two. Uh, Prime Minister Abe of Japan, uh, uh, among them, uh, that, that were facing another blowout like 2008. Um, and actually, as we understand it, as we know it, much worse. This is not in China, this is in the West. Uh, we now have uh, an ongoing meltdown of the banking system. Uh, we're not, it's not clear what the, the actual dimensions of it is. Uh, but you have uh, you have an ongoing emergency Federal Reserve bailout of the repo markets, the overnight markets, uh, to the tune of 60, 80 uh, uh, billion dollars a day uh, in in, uh, uh, in in federal interventions, Federal Reserve interventions. Uh, 24 and 48 hour has now been extended. There's new projects that now are were two week and now they're up to 42 days to take us through the end of the year. Um, th this is because banks are not able to help other banks settle their shortages of accounts overnight. Just short term, overnight uh, lending has frozen uh, between major banks. 
what's going on. It's not clear. There's, there's different there's spec, speculation as to the causes. But it could be a hedge fund, major hedge fund that's gone under. Um, uh, there's a, a Japanese bank that was heavily invested in the collateralized debt obligations, a uh, form of derivative speculation, uh, which has become very popular. And they held a very substantial portion of the market. Uh, and they've uh, essentially been ordered by the Japanese government to reduce their exposure in that market. Um, and that may have set off a chain reaction. Deutsche Bank in Germany uh, is on the verge of bankruptcy uh, in one form or another. Uh, and that's been very publicly uh, covered in the financial media, if, uh, even if the American people are not aware of it. Now, the point here that, that I think is important to underline is, okay, so if there is a financial crash, and, and today, I mean, you can read Bloomberg, you can read, I, look, go, go into the next slide here. Yes. Okay, this is, this is, um, this is uh, economist forecast versus actual results. Going back to 19, what, what's the, 2002? What's 1982. the? 1982. All the way up to 2008, 2009, okay? Um, uh, there's better, probably some better graphics. This is the best one I could find. Uh, but economists are not great at making economic forecasts. There's a reason for that. And this is why LaRouche's physical economics is superior and why LaRouche's forecasting has been superior to any of these folks. Uh, and, and of course, he forecast the 2008 financial blowout. Um, uh, but my point in setting a, this, putting this up here right now is that today, two thirds of all economists polled expect a recession in 2020. <laughs> after, I mean, after all, after all, Trump, Trump's been on and on all day about how our economy is doing great. Yeah, though. yes. If 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 you didn't hear it, yes. Uh, the, uh, my friend good. here is pointing out that Trump has been going on and on about how great the markets are. That yeah. was that last picture, you know, behind Trump with his thumbs up is the <laughs> stock market going up, right? He keeps yeah, saying he that. He keeps saying that. But Trump knows better than that. He said there was a bubble before he was even elected. He was, during the campaign he reared, he was talking about the financial bubble. Um, uh, I think it's important to point out uh, that Trump, to underline this, that Trump, if there is a crash before the 2020 election, well, what is he going to do? He's going to blame the Democrats, and he's going to blame the Federal Reserve for the crash. Right? He's, he's already on the case for the Federal Reserve. Right? right? He's blaming the Federal Reserve day and night, right? Okay. And he'll blame the Democrats, including the impeachment process, for yeah. undermining yes. faith yeah. in the mar markets yeah. and the economy and so on and so forth. Now, he'll do that. But that begs the question. Barbara Boyd made this point the other, the other night. This begs the question, how do we get out of this mess? Okay? Because another crash now, you know, in terms of the effects on people's livelihood, right? This is going to be a disaster. So the question is the solutions. Now the solutions we've been spelling out. We'll move on to the next. Um, and um, first of all, well, this is a little. Um, we can come back to this later if it's interesting in the discussion. Let's move forward. If we can, a few slides to the, to the, uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, yeah. Here's LaRouche, LaRouche's um, triple curve. Triple curve. Victor just pointed out. He knows it by heart. He knows it. The triple curve. Now, this is, this is the triple curve uh, from 1995-1996. Uh, of a typical collapse function, which was what LaRouche was looking at then and pointing out then. Um, uh, with that growth of financial aggregates, that's the stock market, but even more it's what are called financial derivatives, like, uh, like, uh, uh, like what I was talking about a, a moment ago, but financial side bets, mm. speculation on currency, 
on, on whether the sun's going to come up tomorrow, uh, you know, the weather, you name it. Uh, but this is a, a now a over a, a quadrillion dollar global market uh, in financial derivatives. This is the bubble, the huge bubble. And then you have the growth of monetary aggregates uh, to try to sustain that financial bubble. But most importantly is the underlying physical economic input output, that lower line drooping off there to the left in time and going forward in time, the collapse of the physical economic output of the economy, particularly the Western economies we're talking about, you could say now, as well as the United States, you could talk about Europe as well as the United States. This has been the general process that's been going on in terms of the collapse of actual phys the physical economy of, of, the, uh, 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 of these nations, of the, of the transatlantic region. On to the next. Thanks, Mike. Now, this, this is the recent, just this last week, this was a headline article. This is November 29th uh, in the Washington Post. Corporate debt nears a record $10 trillion and borrowing binge poses new risks. I'm just pointing out that this is all becoming very public, this financial crash that's coming on. To, moving on to the next, um, this is just a picture of the derivatives. That's, that's the officially admitted uh, count on a derivatives. That does not take into account what are called over-the-counter derivatives in which there is not a bank involved or other financial uh, shared records uh, in these trades. But you can see that bar to the far left, and you can compare it to global GDP, the next bar over, and so on and so forth. You begin to get a size of what this is uh, in, in terms of a, uh, a global Ponzi scheme of, of uh, debt. Uh, on to the next. Uh, and this is the collapse, uh, one measure of the collapse of the physical economy, that downward drooping uh, 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 line that we saw before in the triple curve. On to the next. Now, getting to the solutions, the quickly to the solutions, first of all is Glass-Steagall, uh, which is a, a re-regulation of the U.S. banking system. Um, originally passed in 1933, and it was the law up until 1999, at least formally on the books. Uh, it had been chipped away at, but it was there. It was operating, and it uh, and secondly, national banking. We have to have a new national credit mechanism. And thirdly, credit itself, credit for jobs. Credit that's not tied to what banks can lend, but it's credit issued by the government based on the future productivity of the nation, the future creativity of the nation, um, uh, including the space program, uh, the spinoffs, and so forth of that. Uh, and fourth, the science driver, which is part of what that credit will finance, including fusion energy. These are the four, um, four features, four laws, as LaRouche described. These are the four intertwined uh, laws that have to be passed uh, to make the United States functional again. Turn, go to the next one. And just on Glass-Steagall, just to give, hopefully give a clear sense of this, what we have now, we have... If you have money in Wells Fargo, if you have money in Bank of America and whatever, you know, you have your checking account or whatnot, you know, that money is not sitting there, as you know. The bank's supposed to be using it some way, lending it and so on. Well, today, virtually all of that money goes across. There's no wall there right now. It goes over to the investment banks. It goes over to the head funds. It goes into speculation, global speculative markets. That's where your money is going. That's why there's no money for Main Street. That's, that's, that, that's the fundamental reason there's no been, been no rebuilding after Hurricane Harvey. You know, the, you know, the governor said we're going to do things. The, the, the lieutenant governor said we're going to build things. The, the mayor said we're going to build things. And here we are now a few years later and we haven't built anything. Well, it's, they don't have any money. Well, where's the money? Why can, isn't there money? Why aren't there resources to be lent? Why aren't there credits to be issued? Where'd the money go? You know? Yeah. This, is, this is what's been going on. Now, glass this was not the case before 1999. It was chipped away at, but nonetheless, we'll just say 1999 is the, uh, is the turning point, when it was repealed. Under Glass-Steagall, commercial banks cannot lend for speculation. 
They cannot engage in speculative activity. They cannot buy stocks and bonds. They cannot go into the insurance business, which in turn the insurance business finances itself by speculation. It can't do any of those things. Commercial banks, to be protected by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, have to engage in lending to farms, to businesses, home builders, you know, and so on and so forth. Mortgages, the, the productive economy of the United States. Uh, and investment banks under Glass-Steagall and speculators are not protected. You know, if you're rich or you're just crazy and you want to, you know, speculate with your money, you can do it, but you're not going to get bailed out. You know, if you go to Las Vegas, the government doesn't step in and pay you back if you lost your money, right? So, so, uh, <laughs> so, under glad, so we're going to put that wall up between commercial banking and investment banking again. Next, next slide. All right, so that's Glass Steagall, but we also have to go to a deeper level here, very briefly. Um, we, and then uh, here I'm going to LaRouche's, Lyndon LaRouche's economics uh, is encompassed in specifically his book, uh, So You Wish to Know All About Economics, or You Wish to Learn About Economics. Um, two key parameters, you know, if you, as opposed to the market, how do you judge productive investment versus non-productive investment? What are the actual measuring uh, uh, rods or uh, metrics. Uh, metrics, yeah, uh, 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 of an economy. As specifically, LaRouche identified two things. One is increases, that was, was those arrows moving to the right there, in energy flux density. We increase energy utilization. We increase its utilization not only in, in amount, but in its concentration, its flux. Uh, think of a, a, a knife cutting through blutter, butter as opposed to trying to hammer a, a, a stick of butter. You know, a, a knife works much better because it's applying that, the energy on, a, on the edge of the knife. Think of, uh, think of a laser uh, and a, a modern machine tool as opposed to uh, uh, what man used to have as, as tools, useful tools. On to the next slide. And the second is, in each, uh, as a measure of economic progress of whether your economy is doing well is in increases in population growth. Uh, what LaRouche calls increases in uh, uh, potential relative population density, um, to be very specific. And it's the growth in the potential to support an ever-growing population that measures the growth of your economy. That, that should, the com combination of the two, increases of energy flux density and increases of potential population density measure the growth of your economy. Now think of it today, we have op the opioid epidemic, we have a, a shrinking lifespan, officially, a, 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 or, you know, according to the U.S. Department of Health. We have uh, uh, an increasing <coughs> suicide rate and so on and so forth. In other words, we, and the same is, it's actually even worse in Europe. If it wasn't for immigration in the United States, it'd be far worse here. Uh, we have declining, and, and throughout the transatlantic region, we have a collapsing relative potential population density. The term relative is just because relative to, to you know, the land, the quality of the land varies from it. parts of the, you know, whether it's desert or mountains or this or that, so you have to, use, so Lynn includes the word relative in it, but the potential population density uh, has been contracted. Uh, that's not because people just stopped having kids, it's because the conditions for them to have kids and raise kids collapsed. The real standards of living. And, uh, and that's reflected in the fact that uh, we, we didn't move on to a full fission economy and we didn't move on to a full, and to a, a fusion economy, but we flattened out into oil and gas, and now, of course, we got um, Greta Thunberg and others saying well, that we now got to go backwards and go to windmills, which was a great technology back in the 11th century, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and solar panels, you know, which, uh, you know, well, anyway. Um, so, um, so, so these are the critical, uh, there, there is an alternative framework 
from which to judge and make decisions on how we move forward for mankind. Uh, next slide. So that's the future on the new Silk Road if we choose to take it. So um, let's, let's stop there. We have just a small group here and we should have some discussion. And there's a lot else that I was thinking about covering, but I've kind of shifted gears here. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully that's I useful. When you finish your question, ask your question, I okay. had a couple of things to report from the call earlier. Well, okay. Plan. I just got a comment. Uh, uh, I reported on Helga and CGTM. Just yeah. The, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, I know. Oh. I was just going to add a few things. Oh, sure. Questions. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I just got a historical comment. You started <laughs> with. Uh, um, uh, remembering the uh, the, uh, the attacks, the, fest, uh, the attacks of uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. That um, I just wanted to uh, to mention that uh, th there were on the same date uh, attacks on the Philippine Islands, and uh, to uh, to to welcome our uh, our uh, current and future uh, Philippine members of the LaRouche organization uh, to the discussion and uh, and also to. Uh, Commend them for the for their uh, their heroism and uh, and sacrifice in the battle against uh, fascism yesterday and today. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you. Well mm -hmm. taken. Keisha, you had. Uh, yeah, no, it was. I know you reported um, in from Helga's trip, uh, which I think is very important for people to grasp the uh, the magnitude of uh, this conference uh, and this event that took place because. You know, what she was saying is that uh, there were probably about 27 different uh, leaders, leaders of 27 major think tanks there. And if you look at the, the picture, uh, Mrs. LaRouche representing the Schiller Institute, uh, which uh, as you see here, our involvement in China, uh, including yeah. her leading That's role Helga, around right? the Belt and Road Initiative has been very <laughs> substantial for for many years. Uh, anyway, she was the only female on the stage um, after the event uh, where they had the lights and glamour and all the, the people uh, opening up this CGTN think tank. Uh, where it says uh, in their website, they say that they, um, it's uh, launched the think tank, 27 leaders from influential think tanks, cooperation. The idea is cooperation among global think think tanks an international platform for exchange. So the point is, is that right in the center of all of, you know, leading world figures, you have the Schiller Institute uh, organizing for the cooperation of U.S.-China relations of not just U.S.-China, but uh, the world uh, mm -hmm. with China. And it's a very, I mean, uh, it, <laughs> it's very exciting to look at right now uh, why in the middle of, in the United States, like Brian just went through very extensively, you have this major fight going on and the targeting against our republic, against the president, but particularly to stop this type of cooperation for world peace, for development uh, from taking place because that's what's at the root of this whole, whole process is that by no means at all can you have positive relations with with China or with Russia because they're the quote unquote enemy. Anyway, so I just wanted to, to bring that out again because what she uh, emphasized, she did get a chance to speak um, and she said there were so many different people there and speakers that uh, they were going to speak for about 15 minutes apiece, but they ended up having to speak for maybe uh, four and she focused her uh, comments, particularly on the importance of the uh, financial crisis underway, the looming financial crisis, and the only way out of this is for the four leading powers, particularly the two leading nations of U.S. and Russia, to come together in a cooperative alliance. So, um, anyway, let's, I thought yeah. I'd just add that. Yeah, thanks. No, thank you. And it really just underscores the need for us to, if we can move America, uh, Glass-Steagall, uh, Glass-Steagall, the reintroduction of Glass-Steagall was in the platforms of both the Republican and Democratic parties uh, in the 2016 election. You know, it was adopted, it was part of the platforms of both political parties. There's already broad, largely due to our work, uh, understanding of the necessity of Glass-Steagall to actually solve 
the crisis that was merely put off, kick, you know, the can was kicked down the road uh, in, in uh, 2008, 2009, and so forth. Yeah. So, so the point is that if, if we're moving the American people forward, um, we're setting up committees of correspondence around the, the country. Uh, this has been underway now for the last few months. Um, to multiply the effort. But if we're moving Americans, you know, increasingly in support of the, uh, of, um, of, uh, the four laws, starting with Glass-Steagall, but the four, these four laws that need to be introduced, then we're going to be creating the environment in which President Trump uh, and saner figures in the Congress uh, can be moved to actually move with the policy as the crisis unfolds. Um, you know, as opposed to just simply saying, Hey, it's their, it's that guy's fault. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, instead saying, okay, now let's get down to work here. Here's what we got to do. Trump knows Glass-Steagall. He's he's spoken to it before in the past. Uh, it, it can be done. Um, and the power of the presidency, uh, freeing uh, the presidency from this impeachment process. It's not just a matter of freeing Trump, but the institution, of defending the institution, the presidency, so it can be wielded in this period of crisis. Uh, the way it was in the 1930s, um, uh, you know, this is the immediate task at hand. And I think what you went through with this is important because people, well, the point is, people can't be afraid to take this this on because this is this is the hot button, if you want to call it. U.S. China. The U.S. Mm -hmm. China it, question. Because, uh -huh. you know, the, all of the uh, anti-China with the Red Scare, you know, communist China, mm -hmm. you know, even the, you probably went through this, even the, um, Congress just passed this uh, bill in Congress where everybody, uh, pretty much except for one person, uh, voted to uh, go after China for uh, its so-called uh, criminal actions against Xinjiang. Uh, but, and it's, I mean, it's the crazy thing about this right now is these types of actions will lead to war mm -hmm. if people do not mm -hmm. actually say, yo, this is not just, oh, uh, we don't like China, or mm -hmm. we don't want China to be the, the new world power, or w w whatever. But mm -hmm. yeah, the, the point is, is that, you know, this is the only thing that's going to get us out of this, this crisis or this threat of war, is to get people to uh, quit the ignorance and the stupidity around the whole uh, China is the big book Black man. propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Fake right. news. Fake news. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. And it's not just about communism either. I mean, there's a long history of, you know, the yellow barrel, yeah. you know, that, 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 that uh, strong China pro supposedly poses to the rest of the world. Uh, but I don't think the media is even helping in any way. They're no. not helping at all. <laughs> well, they, seem to, they seem to be the ones we all need to hope for. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. So if you take over a country, the first thing you do is you take over the TV station. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the the advantage we have cumulatively, factitious advantage, if you will, is that the the media has increasingly discredited itself over the course of mm -hmm. of decades, but particularly over the course of the last few years. Mm -hmm. You know, around the Trump efforts to, to coup uh, the Trump administration in particular. But also before that, I mean, as, as people here know, you know, these fake wars. I mean, people now know that there was no basis for going to war against Iraq. I mean, millions, a million people lost their lives, perhaps. And, and there was no rationale for this, no true mm -hmm. rationale. This was, and it was sold to the American public, mm -hmm. of course, by a bunch of liars, you know, you know, like, by people like Dick Cheney and so on and the British, Tony Blair and whatnot, but uh, it was also sold by the media. There, there was very little questioning, mm -hmm. um, uh, and there was a lot of rah-rah mm -hmm. yellow journalism. Mm -hmm. so, so, but the cumulative effect of this is, you know, is that people are, are aware that the, what they're being told in the media is immediately suspect. Mm -hmm. more, but more importantly, I think, you know, as, as, as I hope we've indicated, you know, the, the, the most important thing is if pe to give be back to people a sense of the potential that exists with the Belt and Road Initiative, with space cooperation, with fusion energy. You know, we could end poverty on the face of the earth. 
we, we could, we could, we, mankind could have a glorious future. Not that everything was going to be solved overnight, but you know, we could be about the task of solving and creating these great solutions. We can end it there in terms of turning off that.